Ladies and gentlemen, the wife of the Vice President, Mrs. Tipper Gore, accompanied by Martin Payone, Mrs. Lott, and Mrs. Gephardt. The First Lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton, accompanied by Elizabeth Green, Amelia Fields, Mrs. Ford, and Mrs. Gingrich. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States, the Honorable Albert Gore Jr., accompanied by John Chambers, Loretta Sims, Jim Berry, Senator Lott, Representative Gephardt, and Representative Army. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, the Honorable William Jefferson Clinton, accompanied by Susan McGill, Greg Casey, Bill Livingood, Senator Warner, Senator Ford, Speaker Gingrich, Senator Lott, Representative Gephardt, and Representative Army. Chief Justice, members of the United States Congress, their family, and guests. 
all one quarter million who have joined here today on the grounds of their capital. Welcome to the 53rd inauguration of the President and the Vice President of the United States of America. Across our nation and around the world, Americans join William Jefferson Clinton as he reconfirms the oath of office as the 42nd President of the United States and Albert Gore, Jr., as he reconfirms the oath of office as the 45th Vice President of the United States. Our first President, George Washington, was inaugurated in 1789. Thereafter, every four years, our citizens have witnessed this transition of authority as required by the Constitution of the United States. It is the conferring of this trust and authority, which has occurred without any interruption for 208 years, that is the cornerstone of our representative democracy. It is a tribute to the providential vision of our founding fathers. It is a tribute to the strength of the character of the American people and the endurance of their institutions. It is a tribute to successive generations of Americans who have guarded our most valuable heritage, our freedom. And Mr. President, may I say, on behalf of the millions and millions of Americans, we express to you our gratitude for this past week have invited to the White House a true man who fought for freedom, and you presented him with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Senator Dole. For two centuries, the American presidential inauguration ceremony has represented both national renewal and continuity of leadership. So it is altogether fitting that is the world's oldest continuous constitutional democratic republic, we gather today to honor this historical triumph and to recommit ourselves to keep our nation strong for future generations. Mr. President, prayer has been an essential part of all inaugural ceremonies. As I was privileged to drive up with you from the White House, you held the Bible and read the passage that you will read today. Therefore, we are honored today to have the Reverend Billy Graham to lead our nation in prayer as he has at seven previous inaugurals. Please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Reverend Graham. President Clinton, Mrs. Clinton, Vice President Gore, Mrs. Gore, I'm going to ask that we all bow our heads in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you today for the privilege of coming into your presence on this historic and solemn occasion. We thank you for your gracious hand, which has preserved us as a nation. We praise you for the peaceful continuity of government that this inauguration represents. We recall that the Bible says, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. You also said that to whom much has been given, much shall be required. We look gratefully to the past and thank you that from the very foundations of America, 
You've granted our forefathers courage and wisdom as they trusted in you. So we ask today that you would inspire us by their example. Where there's been failure, forgive us. Where there's been progress, confirm. Where there's been success, give us humility and teach us to follow your instructions more closely as we enter the next century. Give to all those to whom you have entrusted leadership today a desire to seek your will and to do it. So today, we ask your blessing on President Clinton and his wife Hillary and their daughter Chelsea, and upon Vice President Gore and his wife Tipper and their children. Give to all our leaders the vision of what you desire America to become and the wisdom to accomplish it and the strength to cross the bridges into the 21st century. We pray also for the members of the House and the Senate, for the Supreme Court, and for all who bear responsibility of leadership in this nation, which is blessed with such ethnic diversity. We've not solved all the social problems of our time, such as drugs and racism. Technology and social engineering have not solved the basic problems of human greed, pride, intolerance, and selfishness. We need your insight. We need your compassion. We need your strength. As both President Clinton and Senator Dole urged us in the recent presidential campaign, may this be a time of coming together to help us deal with the problems we face. Oh Lord, help us to be reconciled first to you and secondly to each other. May Dr. Martin Luther King's dream finally come true for all of us. Help us to learn our courtesy to our fellow countrymen that comes from the one who taught us that whatever you want me to do to you, do also to them. Remind us today that you have shown us what is good and what you require of us, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. We ask that as a people, we may humble ourselves before you and seek your will for our lives and for this great nation. Help us in our nation to work as never before, to strengthen our families, and to give our children hope and a moral foundation for the future. So may our desire be to serve you, and in so doing, serve one another. This we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Reverend Graham. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Eagle Scout David Morales, Boy Scout Troop 152, Vienna, Virginia. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my privilege to present the children of the Gospel Mass Choir under the auspices of the Washington Performing Arts Society. More than 100 voices from the Washington metropolitan area make up this unique choir. Accompanied by the United States Marine Band, the choir will perform an original composition by its director, Mr. Ricky Payton, entitled, Let's Build a Bridge Across America.
Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my distinct privilege and honor to present the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who will administer the oath of office for the Vice President of the United States, Albert Gore, Jr. Madam Judge. Mr. Vice President, please repeat after me. I, Albert Gore, Jr., do solemnly swear. I, Albert Gore, Jr., do solemnly swear. 
that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties of the office on which I am about to enter. The duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Every good wish, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, participating in today's program is a person with talent described by music critics as a catalog of all that is virtuous in singing. Accompanied by the United States Army Chorus and Chorale, please welcome the renowned Jesse Norman, who will perform a medley of American music entitled, Oh, Freedom. It's Norman.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carmen. Ladies and gentlemen, as chairman of the Joint Inaugural Committee, it is now my privilege to introduce my co-chairman, Senator Wendell Ford of Kentucky, will introduce the Chief Justice of the United States, Senator Ford. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you my friend John Warner, President Clinton, Mrs. Clinton, Vice President Gore, Mrs. Gore, and my fellow Americans and my colleagues. Hillary Rodham Clinton, wife of the President-elect, will hold the Clinton family Bible. They are joined by their daughter, Chelsea. It is now my great privilege and high honor to present the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the Honorable William Hobbs Rehnquist, who will administer the oath of office to the President and the President-elect of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton.
ready to take the oath, Mr. President. <laughs> Will you raise your right hand and repeat after me? I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America, William Jefferson Clinton. My fellow citizens, at this last presidential inauguration of the 20th century, let us lift our eyes toward the challenges that await us in the next century. It is our great good fortune that time and chance have put us not only at the edge of a new century and a new millennium, but on the edge of a bright new prospect in human affairs, a moment that will define our course and our character for decades to come. We must keep our old democracy forever young. Guided by the ancient vision of a promised land, let us set our sights upon a land of new promise. The promise of America was born in the 18th century out of the bold conviction that we are all created equal. It was extended and preserved in the 19th century when our nation spread across the continent, saved the Union, and abolished the awful scourge of slavery. Then, in turmoil and triumph, that promise exploded onto the world stage to make this the American century. And what a century it has been. America became the world's mightiest industrial power, saved the world from tyranny in two world wars and a long Cold War, and time and again reached out across the globe to millions who, like us, long for the blessings of liberty. Along the way, Americans produced the great middle class and security in old age, built on rival centers of learning and open public schools to all, split the atom and explored the heavens, invented the computer and the microchip, and deepened the wellspring of justice by making a revolution in civil rights for African Americans and all minorities, and extending the circle of citizenship, opportunity, and dignity to women. Now, for the third time, a new century is upon us, and another time to choose. We began the 19th century with a choice 
to spread our nation from coast to coast. We began the 20th century with a choice to harness the Industrial Revolution to our values of free enterprise, conservation, and human decency. Those choices made all the difference. At the dawn of the 21st century, a free people must now choose to shape the forces of the information age and the global society, to unleash the limitless potential of all our people, and yes, to form a more perfect union. When last we gathered, our march to this new future seemed less certain than it does today. We vowed then to set a clear course to renew our nation. In these four years, we have been touched by tragedy, exhilarated by challenge, strengthened by achievement. America stands alone as the world's indispensable nation. Once again, our economy is the strongest on Earth. Once again, we are building stronger families, thriving communities, better educational opportunities, a cleaner environment. Problems that once seemed destined to deepen now bend to our efforts. Our streets are safer, and record numbers of our fellow citizens have moved from welfare to work. And once again, we have resolved for our time a great debate over the role of government. Today, we can declare government is not the problem, and government is not the solution. We, the American people, we are the solution. Our founders understood that well and gave us a democracy strong enough to endure for centuries, flexible enough to face our common challenges and advance our common dreams in each new day. As times change, so government must change. We need a new government for a new century, humble enough not to try to solve all our problems for us, but strong enough to give us the tools to solve our problems for ourselves. A government that is smaller, lives within its means, and does more with less. Yet where it can stand up for our values and interests around the world, and where it can give Americans the power to make a real difference in their everyday lives, Government should do more, not less. The preeminent mission of our new government is to give all Americans an opportunity, not a guarantee, but a real opportunity to build better lives. Beyond that, my fellow citizens, the future is up to us. Our founders taught us that the preservation of our liberty and our union depends upon responsible citizenship. And we need a new sense of responsibility for a new century. There is work to do, work that government alone cannot do teaching children to read, hiring people off welfare rolls, coming out from behind locked doors and shuttered windows to help reclaim our streets from drugs and gangs and crime, taking time out of our own lives to serve others. Each and every one of us, in our own way, must assume personal responsibility, not only for ourselves and our families, but for our neighbors and our nation. Our greatest responsibility is to embrace a new spirit of community for a new century. For any one of us to succeed, we must succeed as one 
America. The challenge of our past remains the challenge of our future. Will we be one nation, one people, with one common destiny or not? Will we all come together or come apart? The divide of race has been America's constant curse. And each new wave of immigrants gives new targets to old prejudices. Prejudice and contempt cloaked in the pretense of religious or political convictions are no different. These forces have nearly destroyed our nation in the past. They plague us still. They fuel the fanaticism of terror, and they torment the lives of millions in fractured nations all around the world. These obsessions cripple both those who hate and, of course, those who are hated, robbing both of what they might become. We cannot, we will not, succumb to the dark impulses that lurk in the far regions of the soul everywhere. We shall overcome them. And we shall replace them with the generous spirit of a people who feel at home with one another. Our rich texture of racial, religious, and political diversity will be a godsend in the 21st century. Great rewards will come to those who can live together, learn together, work together, forge new ties that bind together. As this new era approaches, we can already see its broad outlines. Ten years ago, the Internet was the mystical province of physicists. Today, it is a commonplace encyclopedia for millions of school children. Scientists now are decoding the blueprint of human life. Cures for our most feared illnesses seem close at hand. The world is no longer divided into two hostile camps. Instead, now we are building bonds with nations that once were our adversaries. Growing connections of commerce and culture give us a chance to lift the fortunes and spirits of people the world over. And for the very first time in all of history, more people on this planet live under democracy than dictatorship. My fellow Americans, as we look back at this remarkable century, we may ask, can we hope not just to follow, but even to surpass the achievements of the 20th century in America? and to avoid the awful bloodshed that stained its legacy. To that question, every American here and every American in our land today must answer a resounding yes. This is the heart of our task. With a new vision of government, a new sense of responsibility, a new spirit of community. We will sustain America's journey. The promise we sought in a new land, we will find again in a land of new promise. In this new land, 
Education will be every citizen's most prized possession. Our schools will have the highest standards in the world, igniting the spark of possibility in the eyes of every girl and every boy. And the doors of higher education will be open to all. The knowledge and power of the information age will be within reach not just of the few, but of every classroom, every library, every child. Parents and children will have time not only to work, but to read and play together. And the plans they make at their kitchen table will be those of a better home, a better job, the certain chance to go to college. Our streets will echo again with the laughter of our children because no one will try to shoot them or sell them drugs anymore. Everyone who can work will work with today's permanent underclass part of tomorrow's growing middle class. New miracles of medicine at last will reach not only those who can claim care now, but the children and hardworking families too long denied. We will stand mighty for peace and freedom and maintain a strong defense against terror and destruction. Our children will sleep free from the threat of nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons. Ports and airports, farms and factories will thrive with trade and innovation and ideas. And the world's greatest democracy will lead a whole world of democracies. Our land of new promise will be a nation that meets its obligations, a nation that balances its budget, but never loses the balance of its values. A nation where a nation where our grandparents have secure retirement and health care, and their grandchildren know we have made the reforms necessary to sustain those benefits for their time. A nation that fortifies the world's most productive economy, even as it protects the great natural bounty of our water, air, and majestic land. And in this land of new promise, we will have reformed our politics so that the voice of the people will always speak louder than the din of narrow interests, regaining the participation and deserving the trust of all Americans. <laughs> Fellow citizens, let us build that America, a nation ever moving forward toward realizing the full potential of all its citizens. Prosperity and power, yes, they are important, and we must maintain them. But let us never forget the greatest progress we have made and the greatest progress we have yet to make is in the human heart. In the end, all the world's wealth and a thousand armies are no match for the strength and decency of the human spirit. <laughs> Thirty-four years ago, the man whose life we celebrate today spoke to us down there at the other end of this mall in words that move the conscience of a nation. Like a prophet of old, he told of his dream that one day America would rise up and treat all its citizens as equals before the law and in the heart. Martin Luther King's dream was the American dream. His quest is our quest, the ceaseless striving 
to live out our true creed. Our history has been built on such dreams and labors. And by our dreams and labors, we will redeem the promise of America in the 21st century. To that effort, I pledge all my strength and every power of my office. I ask the members of Congress here to join in that pledge. The American people return to office a president of one party and a Congress of another. Surely they did not do this to advance the politics of petty bickering and extreme partisanship they plainly deplore. No, they call all us instead to be repairers of the breach and to move on with America's mission. America demands and deserves big things from us, and nothing big ever came from being small. Let us remember the timeless wisdom of Cardinal Bernadine when facing the end of his own life. He said, it is wrong to waste the precious gift of time on acrimony and division. Fellow citizens, we must not waste the precious gift of this time. For all of us are on that same journey of our lives. And our journey, too, will come to an end. But the journey of our America must go on. And so, my fellow Americans, we must be strong, for there is much to dare. The demands of our time are great, and they are different. Let us meet them with faith and courage, with patience and a grateful, happy heart. Let us shape the hope of this day into the noblest chapter in our history. Yes, let us build our bridge. A bridge wide enough and strong enough for every American to cross over to a blessed land of new promise. May those generations whose faces we cannot yet see, whose names we may never know, say of us here that we led our beloved land into a new century with the American dream alive for all her children, with the American promise of a more perfect union, a reality for all her people, with America's bright flame of freedom spreading throughout all the world. From the height of this place and the summit of this century, let us go forth. May God strengthen our hands for the good work ahead. And always, always bless our America. Mr. President, 
we thank you for that strong and inspiring message at this very important time in our history. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it is my pleasure to introduce the Emanuel Baptist Church Sanctuary Choir and Orchestra of Little Rock. The choir and orchestra under the direction of Reverend Lynn Madden will present the Battle Hymn of the Republic.
Thank you for the singing of that most inspiring American music. As he did for his first inauguration in 1993, President Clinton has asked a distinguished American scholar to compose a poem for this historic day. Please welcome writer, editor, poet, Mr. Will Miller Williams. Mr. Williams. of history and hope. We have memorized America, how it was born and who we have been and where. In ceremonies and silence, we say the words, telling the stories, singing the old songs. We like the places they take us, Mostly we do. The great and all the anonymous dead are there. We know the sound of all the sounds we brought. The rich taste of it is on our tongues. But where are we going to be? And why? And who? The disenfranchised dead want to know. We mean to be the people we meant to be, to keep on going where we meant to go. But how do we fashion the future? Who can say how, except in the minds of those who will call it now, the children, the children, and how does our garden grow? With waving hands, oh, rarely in a row, and flowering faces and brambles that we can no longer allow. Who were many people coming together cannot become one people falling apart who dreamed for every child an even chance, cannot let luck alone turn doorknobs or not, whose law was never so much of the hand as the head, cannot let chaos make its way to the heart, who have seen learning struggle from teacher to child, cannot let ignorance spread itself like rot. We know what we have done and what we have said, how we have grown degree by slow degree, believing ourselves toward all we have tried to become, just and compassionate, equal, able, and free. All this in the hands of children, eyes already set on a land we never can visit. It isn't there yet, but looking through their eyes, we can see what our long gift to them may come to be if we can truly remember, they will not forget. Santita Jackson will lead the singing of our national anthem. She will be accompanied by the Resurrection Choir, a group composed of singers from the choirs of American churches tragically destroyed by fire in recent months. This choir's performance is a befitting 
commemoration of this day on which we honor also Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Before we sing our national anthem, the Reverend Gardner C. Taylor will deliver the benediction. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the benediction and remain standing to sing our national anthem. Reverend Taylor. Let us lift up our spirits before our Creator, eternal God, brooding over the days of our years in sovereign judgment and yet with tender mercy, now close to the end of this solemn but joyous occasion, we lift our hearts and our hopes before thee. We pray for our president, William Jefferson Clinton, that thou will give to him ever increasing vision and vigor and voice that he might speak tellingly to the American promise in history. We pray for the gracious and gallant lady at his side, Hillary Rodman Clinton, and for their daughter. We ask thy blessings upon the Vice President of the United States and upon his wife, Mrs. Tipper Gore. Grant, we pray that he may ever be more a partisan of what is best in our American tradition. And now, our God, we hold before thee this nation so richly endowed, so greatly blessed, and yet imperiled apparently often by the very richness of its diversity. Deliver us from pettiness of thought, from harshness of speech, and from violence of action. Make us worthy of our history, of patriots, sacrifice, and martyr's blood, in the vanguard of which stand Lincoln and King, thy servants Abraham and Martin. Give us ever a greater dedication and commitment to the great defining words of our democracy, liberty, justice, equality, opportunity. And now, let the words of our mouths, all of our mouths, and the meditations of our hearts, all of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And now unto the only wise God, our deliverer, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. Amen. Now, Ms. Santita Jackson.
Hey. President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton, Vice President Gore and Mrs. Gore. Mrs. Clinton and Chelsea walk in the streets of Pennsylvania Avenue and bringing out the sun. Vice President Gore and Mrs. Gore making their way to the presidential reviewing stand. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice President Gore and Mrs. Gore.
Just a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, just a few minutes away, 6,000 participants in our inaugural parade today. This is a march through American history. You know, you're a part of history because, ladies this and is gentlemen, a the Vice Parade. President of the United States and Mrs. Gore and their family. An American journey building the bridge to the 21st century will include participants from all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and four U.S. territories, 6,000 participants in all. Mr. President, before you got here, we had a little competition on cheering. We had the sunny side of the street cheering, competing against the shady side of the street. Now, shady side of the street, how are you going to welcome the president and the vice president and their families? How? On the sunny side of the street, how are you going to welcome them? Do you want one more chance, shady side? One, two, three. Sunnyside, one, two, three. Eve, can we show him? Shadyside, would you start? One, two, three. Let's go. All the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way to 15, and make a U turn. Cross the street and come down. I think we got bogged down somewhere. Sunnyside, can you do better? One, two, three, let's go.
The parade is making their way up 15th Street on to Pennsylvania Avenue. We have the United States on. Ladies and gentlemen, leading the United States Army units in Division One of today's parade is the Army staff. The Army staff is comprised of officers from the active and reserve components, the National Guard, and the U.S. Military Academy, West Point. From our nation's capital, the United States Army Field Band performs at hundreds of concerts and events, traveling the United States and overseas each year as the musical ambassadors of the...
approaching the reviewing stand, the Valley Forge Military Academy and College Horse Cavalry Unit has journeyed from Wayne, Pennsylvania to Pennsylvania Avenue to represent the Keystone State. The next unit, these Native American tribal leaders are representing 20 tribes from across the country. The first float of the 97 Presidential Inaugural Parade, Volunteers Fife and Drum Corps from Underhill, Vermont, representing the Green Mountain State. 20 band members. From Underhill, Vermont. Approaching the reviewing stand, the float, the roots of freedom, depicts the five centuries of growth of American civil liberties. Also depicts the five centuries of growth of American civil liberties. It leads with a series of snapshots of the early American landscape, a revolutionary soldier, and the framers of the Constitution. You'll see that it's linked to a second float portraying the contemporary evolution of freedom. Who better to represent our country's military history and the state of Colorado than the Association of Living History, a Fife and Drum Corps? Park Service Ranger Color Guard. 20 Rangers. Making their way up Pennsylvania Avenue is the University of Tennessee Marching Band, the Pride of the Southland. The University of Tennessee Marching Band, innovators of the Circle Drill, a 360-degree marching formation. These high-stepping marchers have influenced bands across America. Here they are. marching band is the Omaha Police Mounted Patrol representing Nebraska. New Mexico. Vaqueros de la Sierra, the Culver Black Horse Troop.
the largest mounted cavalry unit in the United States, is representing the Hoosier State. 1997 is an important year for the Culver Black Horse Troop. Not only is their 11th appearance in the North. Following the Culver Black Horse Troop, the New Bedford High School Whalers. They've won many awards and championships along their journey to walk. 130 band members make up the New Bedford High School Whalers. following the new Medford High School marching band, the Millax Band Drum and Dance Troupe from Minnesota. They're demonstrating drumming and dancing that takes place at a powwow, a Native American social gathering. Freestyle single rope champions representing Idaho. They're performing Road Warrior, who has been performing along the parade route all morning. 14 rope jumpers from Rexburg, Idaho. Next, from Charleston, South Carolina, it's the Burke High School Junior ROTC Battalion. This large inner city marching unit is a source of pride and discipline for high school students. 300 core members.
Presidential Reviewing Stand. Representing the Navy and Naval District of Washington is the United States Navy Ceremonial Guard. 91 marchers. Representing the Navy is the United States Navy Color Guard. There are 30 of the Revolutionary War to Desert Storm. Representing the Navy presents more than 12,000 Naval Reservists. Hold on to your hats for this one. It's Florida A&M University's marching band, and they're representing the Sunshine State for the second consecutive inaugural. It's the Marching 100, and they've been rated one of the top marching bands in the country. If you... Our next 
float beyond the melting pot depicts the many faces of America that have expanded the horizons of both science and of our own renewal. There is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America.